Uh, good evening. Uh, I want to thank all of you for attending uh, on such, especially on such short notice. We put this together very quickly, but I'm really thrilled and happy to see the turnout here. And like any shuttle launch, of course, it's the nature of our business to be ready to go at any moment. Uh, at least we don't have a scrub. So thank you to the Gill Roof and Starport folks for helping pull this together um, at the last moment, and really to all of those of you who helped with publicity and sending uh, uh, the notes to your friends and coworkers. It was an email flurry in that last couple of days. I'm Roger Weiss, and I'm a 23-year employee of SAIC. I've been working in the space station payloads office here for the last 10 years. Um, like you all, I'm a diehard space history buff. So what does all this have to do with President Kennedy and the race to the moon? Nothing. Well, actually, just about everything. This Wednesday will be 50 years since President Kennedy proposes a national goal that the U.S. should land a man on the moon before this decade is out. And the famous speech from which we space geeks all have frequently heard the very familiar and notable soundbite uh, was made from Rice University and I believe was it September 62? September 12th. September 12th. And in Dr. John Longston's latest book, John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon, we are now privileged to understand the meat behind this momentous proposal, what led up to it, what might have been different, and what were other options, and how it really set the tone to directly tie into what each and every one of us do here and or love at NASA on a daily basis, including the International Space Station payloads office. <laughs> Dr. Loxton is the Professor Emeritus of Political Science and of International Affairs at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. He was the founder and longtime director of the Elliott School Space Policy Institute, and he offered the decision to go to the moon, Project Apollo in the National Interest, and as general editor of the eight-volume series exploring the unknown selected documents in the history of the U.S. Civil Space Program, a handsome set, I must say so myself. Uh, he, was, he has written numerous articles and reports on space policy and history, and Dr. Watson is a member of the Exploration Committee of the NASA Advisory Council. And he's been a member or a leader in several associations and organizations, as well as a frequent consultant to media on a broad scope of space issues. Uh, following John's talk, he will be signing copies of his book, which are just limited in quantity back there. And they'll be sold by Stark Work. They'll be taking cash and check and credit card, firstborn, male children, whatever you, whatever you have. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate you all coming, and I appreciate John making time for us. Dr. Locke. Let me start by thanking, uh, well, first John David Barco, who heard this presentation in Paris, thought that people here at JSC would be interested in it, and when I found that uh, I wasn't scheduled to talk to a general audience, I called three names and he did the crucial thing he called Roger. Uh, and, and so I really have to thank Roger for uh, uh, a Herculean effort of pulling this together in a very few days. Thank you all for coming out. I hope what I have to say about this book, uh, I was saying as I was signing books in, in the uh, Building 3 cafeteria uh, today, this is kind of the cliff notes of the book. Uh, there, there's a lot more detail, a lot more texture in the book. But it, this will give you a sense of, of, of the general thing. Here's what I'm going to talk about. First of all, why did Kennedy uh, decide to send Americans to the moon? Uh, as Roger said in his introduction, I wrote a book about that 40 years ago, published in 1970. Uh, and the publisher, MIT Press, graciously allowed me to use as much of that book in this book. So there are verbatim passages from the long ago book. Uh, the stories stay pretty consistent. I had it right in 1970, which makes me feel pretty good. There's more detail uh, in it. Uh, and one reason for doing the book is that there's a, a lot more information available uh, now than when I wrote the, the first book. And I, I stopped in the first book with the announcement of the decision. This book goes through to the end of the Kennedy administration what uh, JFK did to make his proposal a uh, reality. Um, and that's the second topic I'll talk about. 
And then he spent a little time at the end asking, was this a success? Was Apollo a good thing to have done? And uh, that's not a straightforward question to answer. You'll see my kind of struggles in answering it. And then at the end, just as he presses, uh, talk a little bit about the current situation in space and whether there's anything that could be learned from the Apollo experience that's relevant to this current confusing and, in my view, unsatisfactory situation. So that's the agenda. One thing to realize is that Kennedy came to the White House not very interested in space. He had used the Soviet space achievements from Sputnik and, and orbiting of the dog Laika and sending a spacecraft out to the moon as symbols of the failure of the Eisenhower administration during the 1960 presidential campaign. But he hadn't thought much himself about the implications of space. Uh, one, one thing I kind of came to the conclusion after uh, doing all this research is that Kennedy was not very comfortable with technology. He really didn't have a feel for technical issues. Uh, and the best symbol of, of his lack of priority to space issues uh, was the fact that he delegated the lead role in his administration uh, on space issues to his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who he had chosen so he could win the election. He needed Southern votes to win the election, first of all, he needed Texas. Uh, but he did not want Lyndon Johnson in the main line of policy making in his administration, so he gave Lyndon something to do had something to do. The two things were equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity, and space. Uh, and when first asked what he wanted to do about the space program uh, in 1961, Kennedy said, I don't know. I'm not ready to make a decision. As Eisenhower left office, uh, there was great uncertainty of the future of the human spaceflight program after Project Mercury, and indeed the future of NASA. The Air Force it would, it mounted a very vigorous campaign in 1960 to try to take back the lead role in space from this uh, upstart new space, civilian space agency. And Kennedy had not given very clear signals during the campaign of his intent. He had a hard time finding somebody to run uh, NASA. Uh, various accounts say that something between 19 and 26 people were considered before Jim Webb, uh, James Webb, was identified as a candidate uh, acceptable to all that were concerned. Uh, I think Mr. Webb comes out very well in this book, by the way, and, and, and uh, even as, as a very late choice, I think he was a perfect choice for uh, carrying out Kennedy's mandate. Uh, so he was, at, he, Kennedy was asked whether he was ready to approve a post, uh, some money for a post-Mercury spaceflight program, which was already called Apollo. At that point, it was a three-person, three-man at that point, uh, Earth-orbiting vehicle with possibility of certain lunar flight that was not intended as, as a lunar landing program. Uh, and he says, no, I'm not ready to do that. I'll put some more money in for uh, a, the Saturn family of boosters because we clearly are in a tail chase in, in in lifting power, but I don't know what I'm going to do with respect to human spaceflight. Three weeks later, Yuri Gagarin, and that changed the calculus dramatically. The world reaction, the domestic U.S. reaction, all positive, all saying once again the United States had failed uh, to, to uh, uh, take its rightful position in space leadership. Uh, it's hard. I look around this audience, and most of you are over 40, not all of you. Uh, it's hard to recreate for people that weren't there the bipolar uh, U.S.-Soviet confrontational character of the Cold War relationship. Uh, the fact that, that we, uh, we viewed ourselves in, as a rival to the Soviet Union for the allegiance of the countries that were making a transition from uh, being colonies to newly independent and choosing what form of social organization they were going to take, communist, uh, socialist, or, or capitalist, democratic, uh, and, and the, the military dimensions of the confrontation. I don't know 
whether any of you had a uh, bomb shelter in your backyard. A lot of people did at that point in, in time. Uh, and Kennedy was convinced by the world reaction, the domestic reaction to Gagarin, that the United States could not, by default, let the Soviet Union dominate in this new area of human activity. Uh, <coughs> he called his advisors together two days after the Gagarin flight. The date is important for reasons you'll see in a minute. And, and said, well, what do we do? Are there ways of catching up with the Soviet Union in space? And I think it was at that meeting uh, that uh, Hugh Dryden, the NASA deputy administrator, said, well, Mr. President, if you provide adequate resources, we might be able to beat the Soviet Union to the moon. Uh, and this captured Kennedy's imagination, according to his assistant, Ted Sorensen. As he left the room, he said, nothing is more important than uh, finding out how to catch up in space. That was the 14th of April. Three days later, uh, the United States uh, supported uh, Cuban, uh, not rebels, but Cuban expeditionary force invaded Cuba at the Bay of Pigs with the idea of overthrowing the Castro regime. After promising air support, uh, Kennedy decided he wasn't going to do that. And while the Soviet Union looked strong and successful, the United States looked kind of weak and vacillating, and particularly this young, vigorous leader who tried to portray himself as, as getting the country moving, look indecisive. Uh, I don't think that Apollo was a reaction to the Bay of Pigs, but it certainly reinforced Kennedy's determination to get something positive uh, on the books. Then he set out some requirements. You folks all work with requirements. This is about the clearest requirement statement you could have find me a space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win. Space, dramatic, win were the three criteria. Uh, Kennedy asked Lyndon Johnson to conduct a, a, a rapid review of the options available. Uh, and Johnson did that and brought in representatives from all the services, NASA, Department of Defense, some public citizens, members of Congress, particularly his colleagues in the Senate, uh, and the answer came back, moon. Two reasons. One was a technical reason, uh, which was that, that to get people to the surface of the moon and back, both the United States and the Soviet Union would have to build a new rocket. Uh, the rocket the Soviets had, called the R-7, which was a converted ICBM, still in use today, a much upgraded version is the Soyuz launcher, but still going on the same launch pad that Sputnik and Gagarin were launched from, uh, was capable, it was calculated, uh, and uh, Werner von Braun was, was, was consulted as an individual without asking NASA leadership uh, about it, uh, consulted and, and, and was, his credibility was critical, I think, in, in this assessment, that the Soviet Union was likely to be able to do everything except or up to landing a human per person on the moon with the existing rocket, even a loop around circumlunar flight, not an or not a, not an orbital, but, but a loop around the moon, but that to do anything that involved the landing mass on the uh, significant mass of the lunar surface and getting it back to the Earth would require a new rocket. Dr. Von Braun, Dean Dr. Von Braun said, in a rocket building race with adequate re with adequate resources given to me and my team, we will win. Uh, and he was right. Uh, the political rationale of the need for a dramatic national goal was given in a memo signed by Robert McNamara and James Webb, went to the White House on May the 8th, we'll see if we're in a moment the significant uh, date, which had some, had some wonderful rhetoric in it. It's man, not machines, not merely machines that captured imagination of the world, and that the prestige from uh, dramatic space achievements was part of the battle along the fluid front of the Cold War. Not much about space exploration, not a vision of the importance of space. For Kennedy, doing things in space was a tool to advance broader national security interests, not, not military, but broad 
U.S. interests in the world, uh, and, and, and that was the basis of it. He approved this recommendation. One thing had to happen, which was the flight of Alan Shepard, which came right in the middle of this uh, uh, decision process on May the 5th. Kennedy got personally very much involved in decisions related to this flight. His technical advisors were very worried of whether humans could survive the different regimes involved in, in going into space, the buildup of Gs, the quick transition uh, to a microgravity zero G environment, and then the reentry cycle with state without blacking out or potentially dying. Gagarin's flight removed some of that concern since Gagarin came back healthy. But then there was the issue of, of the level of risk. Uh, the loss of mission risk at that time was estimated to be about 10%, and the loss of crew about 5%. You would never fly these days with those kind of numbers. And the idea of losing Shepard on a mission right after the Bay of Pigs was very worrisome to Kennedy. And particularly since the plans, announced plans were to develop, televise a launch live. So there, there were lots of discussions culminating in the Oval Office meeting on April the 29th, where Kennedy gave the personal, his personal go ahead to taking the risks associated with the mission. Fairly gutsy decision. Uh, and when, when the flight was a success, it was one more reinforcement of the momentum that was building to go ahead. These pictures, the top one, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and some others in the picture. Jackie Kennedy was walking by and her and President Kennedy said, come in and watch this. They're watching Shepard's launch on a little black and white television in Kennedy's secretary's office. And he'd been pulled out of a National Security Council meeting discussing what to do in Vietnam. Some of these do run together. Uh, and then the bottom one is this is after the flight of Shepard and the other six Mercury astronauts to the White House on May the 8th, same day that Kennedy received the recommendations uh, to go ahead with a lunar landing program. Uh, Shepard uh, was kind of paraded through town, through Washington, and, and with, with uh, a great outpouring of public uh, admiration and success. Uh, Kennedy was his first meeting with the astronauts, he immediately found in them kind of kindred souls. The term right stuff had not been invented, but if it had, both Kennedy and the astronauts would have bonded over the kind of behavior that, that was associated uh, with, with that. Uh, Shepard's, by the way, the only astronaut, the only person that went to the moon that Kennedy ever met. Uh, but he never met the people in the second and third classes of, of, of the astronauts. Uh, and clearly the Shepard flight reinforces uh, the decision to go ahead. You've all heard this, but it's worth hearing again. The achievement in space, which occurred in recent weeks, should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieve the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Usually that's where clips from the, the uh, May 25th speech stop. But Kennedy went on to stress the character of the burden that he was asking the country to take on. And I think it's worth listening. In contrast to most presidential speeches, which only stress the positive, this, this says this will put significant burdens on the country.
it's a pretty good charge to the people that did Apollo. Uh, and NASA responded to that charge very well. I know there are a lot of people in this room that were part of that. We forget the character. Uh, oh, that's the transition slide. And Kennedy not only talked the talk, unlike some of his successors, he walked the walk. He provided the resources. He may have wavered in his support at times, uh, not certain that the candle was worth the price. But when push came to shove and uh, decisions on funding, decisions on support of NASA uh, were made, he made them in a positive way. Uh, one forgets just how much the resources, uh, resource commitment was. Uh, first year, the budget went up 89%. The second year, 101%. The third year, 40%. Major capital investment, including the building of the Manned Spacecraft Center, Launch Complex 39, and all the other facilities for NASA. Uh, a doubling in size of the civil service workforce, quadrupling in size uh, in the uh, contractor workforce, all in a period of just over two years. That was a warlike but peaceful mobilization of effort toward, uh, to a uh, a, a particular goal, unparalleled in U.S. peacetime history, by the way, just to give you some comparative measures. Apollo in last year's dollars, $151 billion. The Panama Canal, $8 billion. Manhattan Project, $28 The interstate highway system, which is the thing that uh, comes closest, but that was over 30 years and funded off budget, uh, $128 billion. Uh, People ask me, and so I got asked to give me these numbers, how Apollo compared to other big NASA human spaceflight projects. And it's interesting that the shuttle, over its now 40 years, almost 40 years from the approval, cost more than Apollo. Apollo was spent 15 years less. Uh, but still, the money has been there for major projects. Station, taking away the cost of the shuttle flights, $55 billion. So the nation's been willing to spend money on space, hasn't been willing to spend it, or hasn't been able to spend it in a focused way that produces the kind of results we got during Apollo. I added this slide for this talk down here. <coughs> uh, uh, 1961, most of the energy was spent uh, figuring out where to do the work of Apollo. There was no doubt that the booster work would be done at Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, there was very little controversy in putting the engine test facility in an isolated area where nobody wanted to be in Mississippi. Uh, uh, Michu was an abandoned tank and truck factory that had the size to build the 33-foot first stages of Apollo and ship them by barge. Florida. Uh, there was some political controversy over the location of the launch site. There were a lot of sites considered. The two finalists were Cumberland Island in Georgia, just north of uh, the Florida uh, border, and Merritt Island, uh, adjoining the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And the final decision to go to the Cape was made basically on the grounds that there was so much infrastructure there already in place. Things like hurricanes and, and salt water didn't apparently get factored into the decision very much. By contrast, there was lots of politics in the location of the new center that was going to be needed to carry out Apollo. As he left, well, the original plan was to move uh, the space task group headed by Bob Gilruth from Langley to Goddard Space Flight Center. And then as he left office, the first NASA administrator Keith Clemon said, well, let's move them to Ames. That's a good place to put human space flight. But when it became clear with the dimensions of Apollo that a, a whole new center would be needed, uh, the question then was what, where to put it. And key to that decision was uh, the person who got its post office named after it, uh, uh, Representative Albert Thomas, uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, chaired NASA's Appropriations Subcommittee, and he made it very clear to 
anybody who would listen that if NASA wanted the kind of budget that would be required, Houston would get uh, the location. It was aided in that with the local business and real estate interests uh, with George Brown uh, of Brown and Root being a very important player in there. Lyndon Johnson was not a very important person in this decision. And in fact, it was largely made while Johnson was out of the country. Uh, and that was back when Texas was a democratic state, but it was a fractious democratic state. And Albert Thomas uh, and Lyndon Johnson were, not, were parts of different democratic factions within the state. I mean, it's kind of ironic that this place is named after Lyndon Johnson, who did not have a whole lot of influence in the decision to come here. Um, <coughs> NASA did a site selection process. Well, um, before that, I should say, Kennedy came under all kinds of pressure from the Massachusetts uh, of congressional and, and, and state uh, interest the locating center in Massachusetts. Uh, and, and Mr. Webb got some deadline uh, guidelines and criteria, one of which is it had, it had to be uh, below the Macy Dixon line so that you could work outside all year round. And that was a way of eliminating Massachusetts as a possible. <laughs> uh, the site selection team came back. Its first choice was McDill Air Force Base in Tampa. And Houston was second. McDill was supposed to be closed because of a BRAC, Base Realignment and Closure Commission. The Air Force decided not to close it, took it off the list, and Houston popped up to the top. Now, whether, given the political interests, Webb and his associates would have accepted the recommendation to go to Florida, to me, is very unlikely. Uh, we'll never know. In 62, as the program gained momentum, Kennedy decided to go on an inspection tour to see what was uh, uh, being built, anticipating some very tough budget decisions of was he really ready to put in the money required in the fall. Uh, he went first of all to Huntsville, and in Huntsville heard a uh, impromptu debate between on one side his science advisor Jerry Wiesner, on the other side Webb and Von Braun, about the two choice of lunar orbit rendezvous, uh, which the White House Science Office uh, fought vigorously, tooth and nail, tediously to the very end. Uh, and finally, Kennedy decided it's NASA's job. If NASA says LOR, we'll go with LOR. Uh, and besides, NASA has all the money. I've only got a science advisor. <laughs> uh, and it was on that trip, despite what some people have used to think, that. Kennedy made his most famous space speech. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are willing to postpone, and one we intend to win. One little sidelight to those words, which are most quoted, is they were came out of the NASA input into the speech. Some NASA public affairs officers at first coined it, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Uh, not Ted Sorensen, not JFK. While he was on this trip, Kennedy was told that Jim Webb was an obstacle to success, that he was insisting on spreading money to all elements of the programming providing inadequate money uh, to the Apollo pro program. He was told this by Brayden Holmes, who was at uh, that time the associate administrator for manned space flight. And Holmes told Kennedy um, um, that with adequate funding, extra funding, we might even be able to get to the moon by 1966. Kennedy went out on his speech with the question of whether uh, it was worthwhile to go to the moon he came back with the thought how soon we could get there. Is that better than this one? <laughs> no. <laughs> and a scotch. <laughs> uh, but it was clear. Uh, Holmes continued to fight with Webb inside NASA about funding for Apollo. And when he didn't get satisfaction, he went to uh, the press, leaked a story that said Webb was not supporting it. 
Kennedy's goals and that someone would have to go and might well be Webb. Uh, Kennedy being a uh, interventionist president in the sense of knowing what was going on inside his administration said, what is going on here? Uh, and called a meeting in the cabinet room November the 21st, uh, 1962. That's three weeks after the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was a little busy before that. Uh, and this, I think, is going to be hard to hear, but it's the clearest statement of Kennedy's thinking uh, at that point of why Apollo was worth doing. And it's interesting to have a NASA administrator argue with the president. You'll hear a little of that with Mr. Webb. Rather than compete. 
in his inaugural address, Kennedy had said, let us explore the stars together. He had a task force, White House task force, working on ident uh, ideas for cooperative missions from February through April of 61. Uh, their work kind of ended with the Gagarin flight and Kennedy's reaction to it. But he brought back the idea as he met Khrushchev for the one and only time in Vienna, 10 days after announcing he was gonna go to the moon. This was a very tense, very confrontational meeting uh, with, with very little opportunity to bring up cooperation, but at the two lunches that uh, first the United States and then the Soviet Union uh, hosted it. Both lunches, Kennedy said to Khrushchev, why don't we go to the moon together? Uh, to which Khrushchev said, no, uh, it would reveal too much of our military capability. And what he really meant is our military weakness. Uh, if, if we uh, let you understand where, what our space capabilities really are. But in the rest of 61 and 62, leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was really very little opportunity for meaningful cooperation, although there were some small initiatives after John Glenn's flight. But at the end of 63, August, September 63, Kennedy um, uh, returned to the cooperative theme. And it's not quite clear his reasoning. Uh, there is a tape of a meeting between Kennedy and Webb on September the 18th, 1963, uh, in which Kennedy told Webb <coughs> he was going to propose cooperation. And that tape was not released in time for the book. It's going to be released Wednesday. It drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, uh, so, it, and I'm told that there's some stuff in it that will perhaps make me rethink a little bit my interpretation of all of this. Nature of writing history, I guess. Uh, so that in a very public setting on September the 20th, 1963, Kennedy went before the General Assembly of the United Nations and said, Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. So I will ask this audience, how many of you knew that happened, remember that that happened, or knew it? A few. That's actually more than the usual one person in a space crowd. It just doesn't fit the narrative that this happened. But I conclude that Kennedy was quite serious. Uh, a mixture of motivations, trying to reduce tensions between the two countries, maybe releasing, relieving some of the pressures of uh, the budget burdens of competing. Uh, he, he pushed for uh, making that proposal real in the remaining two months of his life. And I'll come back to that in a minute. One thing to realize is at that point, we were racing only ourselves. The Soviet Union did not formally decide to have a lunar landing program until late 1964. This image is of two M1 moon rockets built by the Soviet Union on the launch pad probably in 69, maybe 1970. The N1 had been approved, but like the current big rocket here, it was a big rocket built with no mission uh, uh, at, at the time it was approved. There was no evidence in 62 or 63 that the Soviet Union was building this rocket. Our photo satellite, intelligence satellites didn't see any new launch pads or other facility construction. Our, Electronic intelligence didn't pick up anything that indicated a major new booster program. Still, the CIA said, Soviet Union is probably going to have a lunar program, but not on a pace competitive with the United States. Uh, so in the context uh, of all of this, we were only racing ourselves in the three years of Kennedy's presidency. There was, at the same time, a major review of the totality of U.S. activity in space, both civil and military. Uh, and uh, uh, 
it's clear in the context of that review that some of the people around Kennedy were suggesting slowing down or even canceling Apollo, uh, particularly slowing down, relaxing the end of the decade deadline. Uh, there's a fascinating memo quoted at length in the book, uh, which the Bureau of the Budget looked at all the options uh, and Apollo only go build the Saturn V, but don't use it to go to the moon and with the strong lifting power it would give. Um, go forward with Apollo at a slower pace or stay with the current program. The staff recommendation coming out of DOB was to stay with the current program. Um, Kennedy never saw that memo. It was dated, the final version was dated November the 29th, one week after he was killed. So what he might have done uh, can only be a member, matter of speculation. But the day before he was assassinated, he made a speech in uh, San Antonio at the dedication of the Aerospace Medical Facility, which is my favorite Kennedy space speech. We have a long way to go. doesn't sound like somebody was ready to quit. Mm -hmm. So what does one think about all of this? I think in trying to assess Apollo in its fullness, uh, the first thing to start with is, is the set of assumptions that uh, underpin Kennedy's decision to start and maintain his commitment uh, to Apollo. I think there was an assumption that America, by right, by its own character, should be first in new areas of human activity. Uh, the the phrase, academic phrase is American exceptionalism. This was a special, was and is a special country. Uh, the liberal assumption that humans can, using technologies that, it, that human, humans can develop, master nature, and do almost anything they want to do. That space was going to be an important element of not only hard military power, the soft power of imagery uh, and, and, and prestige and that the United States had to be in a position to gain, uh, to at least match, if not exceed, the Soviet Union in uh, operating in this new ocean of space. And that it was a legitimate use of government power to organize and finance large-scale projects uh, aimed at a particular goal, that that was an appropriate federal role. Tea Party would not agree with that. <laughs> uh, again, I don't want to have time. We can go about it, into it a little bit in the Q&A if you want. Uh, the image of Kennedy as president in the scholarly literature uh, of the presidency is not unvarnished. I mean, there are pop images that he was a great president. But, but there's a widespread of views, uh, with a couple of which I've quoted here, uh, of, of the character of Kennedy as president, and even a widespread of views of what he was doing as he decided to go to the moon. Was it a thoughtful, fully eyes open decision? Uh, as as uh, Willis Shapley, who's one of these obscure but terribly influential people inside the Bureau of the Budget in, in the 60s, 
or was this a panic-stricken reaction, theatrical, uh, driven by the Bay of Pigs? Uh, I think the positive images there are closer to the reality, but clearly there was some elements of Kennedy's personal character, his competitiveness, uh, his relative youth. Bob Gilruth, place named for him, met Kennedy on this maybe eighth visit for the first time and, and had a discussion in which Kennedy said he was thinking about going to the moon and Gilruth, who was only about six years older than Kennedy, said he was a young man. If he had been a little older, he might not have been so bold. Uh, uh, the one clear conclusion is that Kennedy was not a space visionary. People like to kind of canonize him uh, as, as someone that led the country into a, 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 a exciting future in space. Not at all the picture that emerges from this account. Rather, this was, he was a politician and, he saw, and a policy maker who saw space achievement as a way of advancing a whole set of U.S. national interests uh, that, that justified the expense of, of carrying out the program. Clearly, in terms of his objectives of U.S. prestige abroad, soft power, and national pride, Apollo was a success. Uh, this picture, which is hard to interpret, is the Apollo 11 crew under their sombreros in Mexico City as they toured after their mission. And that kind of reaction uh, was typical of the way they were received around the world. Um, one veteran diplomat, Alex Johnson, said, prestige from Apollo was greater than anything the United States had done since the end of World War II. And clearly the images of Apollo were part of our national uh, icons. Uh, when we want to feel good about this country, we go back to things we've done in space. Uh, and, and, and that's an important and lasting contribution. It's given rise to a cliche. You, you could put whatever your problem is in, in place of the three dots, the ellipsis. Uh, I thought when I wrote the book in 1970, kind of in the uh, afterglow of Apollo, that indeed the Apollo approach might be used for other large-scale uh, undertakings. I've revised myself uh, and, and, and uh, come to the conclusion that uh, the circumstances that made Apollo possible were unique. Uh, and, and the convergence of leadership style, uh, the whole set of uh, politic and political developments at the time, uh, and technological feasibility, and the willingness, the economic situation that had made the resources available, and that Apollo can't serve as a model for either future space ventures or probably not other large scale undertakings. This phrase is probably empty of content. Uh, that the way we put men on the moon is not applicable to other things we would like to do. And I come to the rather unfortunate conclusion from my perspective that Apollo was not good for the future of the program. It, it, by setting a race to achieve a particular objective by a particular time, with no context of what might follow that achievement, uh, and there wasn't any, uh, I think the, the program hit a dead end, and we had to come back in 1970, 71, and 72, and basically start over, uh, and go back to, to uh, the, you all know, the idea of building a space station and supporting it with a logistics vehicle, and when that didn't work, getting support for the logistics vehicle without for 20 plus years of destination. Uh, there was no political support in 1970 uh, for the kind of large scale space effort that made Apollo possible. Richard Nixon said uh, space has to become a normal part of our politics, not something special. I'm not sure the space community has ever adjusted to that reality. It continues to hope and act as if it might be just around the corner that something like Apollo might emerge again. I think it's a false hope. Uh, last year, President Obama laid out what I call the post-Apollo strategy of 
building capabilities rather than schedules and destinations. Uh, that approach, uh, talk about uh, whether it was a sound approach or not, it certainly was done without much analysis uh, or, or consultation with the, the people that knew what they were talking about. Uh, met strong opposition, as you all well know, uh, and, and the Senate came up with an alternative path for the future that was embodied in the authorization bill last September, which the White House, rather than fighting for its point of view, signed. The White House came, basically, and said that, that the kind of space program that Mr. Obama had laid out was not worth fighting for. Uh, and so you have a totally unsatisfactory situation today uh, with, with uh, more confusion, more uncertainty about the future than I am over 40 year career of following this stuff rather closely have, have ever seen previously. Uh, I know this Johnson Space Center uh, employees, and, and it's true around the, at least the human spaceflight part of the uh, agency, to have a sense of what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and that's really unfortunate. It's not clear that this country and its leadership has the will to fix the situation. I hope it does, but I think it's going to take a re-engaged White House uh, and a re-engaged president to address the current situation and maybe find a way out. My preferred way out was suggested by John Kennedy in his UN speech in 1963. Listen to the words, they're remarkably pressing. Did uh, LBJ consider uh, cooperating with the Soviets, or did that die when Kennedy died? Yeah, it's a good question. I wonder if this works. Hold on just a second. Is there anything under, underneath? No. Good thought. Uh, did LBJ consider uh, continuing Kennedy's push for cooperation with the Soviet Union? I think the answer is pretty clearly no. NASA didn't, was not enthusiastic about Kennedy's initiative at all. Uh, and uh, I think Johnson was much closer to the NASA position that, that uh, it would be kind of destructive of the pro program to open it up to potential working with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And so within two or three months of Kennedy's death, the possibility had just disappeared. 
course, the Soviet Union at that point didn't give any indication. Uh, that's not quite true. Khrushchev had made noises about being willing to uh, explore Kennedy's invitation before Kennedy was killed, but afterwards there was no response from the Soviet Union uh, to the initiative. So it was still born. And Apollo became a memorial to a fallen president, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think an unstoppable uh, U.S. unilateral undertaking. Yes, sir? Following that, can you elaborate on Apollo Soyuz cooperation? Can I elaborate on Apollo Soyuz? Um, there was a decision made in 1969 at the time that the Nixon administration turned to saying what its post-Apollo space policy would be to shift from unilateral to a more international approach. Uh, and, and that had two legs to it in, in human spaceflight. Uh, one was uh, asking Japan, Canada, and Europe whether they were interested in participating in our post-Apollo <coughs> program, uh, which turned out to be shuttle. And Europe and J Japan, Europe and Canada said yes. Japan, which was just starting its space program, said we're not ready. And the other thrust was, to, as a symbol of detente, uh, to reach out to the Soviet Union for cooperative cooperation, which ended up being Apollo-Soyuz. One of the things that, again, very few people remember is that NASA and the Soviet Academy of Sciences signed an agreement for post-Apollo Soyuz cooperation, May the 1st, 1977, you could look it up, that said, first a uh, shuttle flight to a Soviet uh, space station, at that time Salyut, which ended up being Shuttle Mir, and then working together on a larger space station. U.S. didn't implement that agreement because the Carter administration uh, disapproval of Soviet intervention in Afghanistan and human rights records. So it took another 10 or 15 years to go back to something that was on the boards in 1977. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think would be the impact of an imminent Chinese landing on the moon? Would it be something you've already done, or do you think it would be a resurgence of uh, competition? Well, the question is, uh, which gives me a time to wrap on it a bit, what do I think about the imminent Chinese? No, if there were. If, if there were, were, I thought you said imminent. Not imminent, but if there were. If there were a Chinese landing on the moon uh, while we were still in a low Earth orbit, then shame on us. Uh, I mean, the Chinese program is a slow-paced, well-designed, development, a step-by-step -step development of capabilities for human spaceflight, which at this point aims at the in-orbit assembly of a small space station in the early 2020s. And clearly, any country that is doing human spaceflight will say, then what? And say, should we then go beyond Earth orbit and perhaps go to the moon? And so uh, I, I know the Chinese are thinking about it, but there's no Chinese lunar landing program at this point with resources being put against it. Uh, if, if, if the United States and its allies and Russia uh, choose not to uh, initiate a human exploration program and China does, uh, you know, that's our failure. Not, uh, and, and we'll say something about the, uh, the relative standing of, of uh, uh, China w with respect to the rest of the world in the 21st century. It won't have the same dramatic impact as Apollo had, just because it's already been done. But it will certainly have an impact. Yeah, John did. You talked at the end about the importance of some presidential leadership to, for the future. I'm, I'm personally a little down on Congress right now. Uh, would, would you say that there's that we need a change in Congress in order to have a more substantial long-term program in NASA, or are they, are they just, that they don't matter and it's really only what happens in the White House? Well, Congress fills vacuums. And uh, what happened last year was there was a vacuum in the White House, the presidential leadership, which Congress filled. 
think back at the last time that Congress took the initiative of designing the characteristics of the space program. It's been a long time. And that's good, I think. I mean, <laughs> you know, this 535 member body representing diverse interests is unlikely to lead uh, in an area such as space. So, uh, so the, the current situation, I think, is an aberration and may reflect uh, on, on the lack of leadership coming from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, I mean, I'm very disappointed. I, you know, I supported Obama, helped write some elements of his space policy, uh, spirit of full disclosure. Lori Garber was one of my former students. Uh, uh, and, and the fact that the White House put out a, uh, a provocative and I think fairly interesting new approach and then caved almost immediately when it ran into opposition, uh, to me it's very disappointing. Uh, yes, sir? One of the uh, achievements of the International Space Station, in addition to technical aspects, is the uh, development of the capability to work together with the international partners. So there's no reason why we can't do the same thing and go to Mars. Well, um, I think we ought to go back to the moon first, but that's well, moon, moon and Mars. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> one of the hallmark achievements of Station is the international partnership that has sustained itself through the ups and downs of that program. It hasn't been a love feast all the way right. through. Uh, and, and uh, again, if we don't build on that, uh, it, it was only possible be, by U.S. leadership. Uh, and if we don't build on that, shame on us. When we started working with the Russians, it was kind of cold and it warmed as, as we yeah. continued to go. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the relationship between uh, NASA and Roscosmos is a very good working relationship. But neither side totally trusts the other. <laughs> They know how to work together, and that's that's enough. Right. Uh, you know, they don't have to be wed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can only the, answer, the question is, what's the influence of, of lobbyists mm -hmm. on congressional decisions, not only in space, by the way? Right. Uh, I mean, uh, money has corrupted our political process in ways that are really unfortunate. Uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, including uh, uh, decisions on shaping the future of our space effort in to the benefit of particular uh, economic and commercial and industrial interests. Uh, the system is designed to allow people to push their interests, but election has become so expensive, being a politician has become so expensive that there is, I think, a disproportionate uh, influence on those people that can produce money. Uh, which is what lobbyists are good for, uh, and it's it it, it I'm, I'm again after a long career of observing policy making close up in Washington, I I think the system is broken, uh, and that that to expect, I mean Congress can't pass appropriations bills, uh, we live in a world of continuing resolutions, you get all kinds of strange things written into bills. Uh, it, it, the system is not working to the benefit of the general population, and lobbyists are an important mm -hmm. part of that. Yes, sir. You had a slide to show the Russian N1 yep. rockets. I seem to recall that there was an explosion, no, a massive explosion. <coughs> well, you're con probably confusing two things. Okay. I mean, there were three launches of the N1 one of which that exploded very close to the launch pad and did a lot of damage. They, there was never a successful N1 launch, there were only three tries. When was that? Uh, 69, 70, 71. I think what you're thinking of was the launch of a Soviet uh, ICBM test launch where uh, the Marshall Nedlin 
uh, sent the launch crew out to inspect why it wasn't working and the thing blew up with hundreds of people on the launch pad. And that was 1960, I think. Uh, I mean, that was the one that killed a lot of people. So that, very that's early very the early, and it wasn't space related. Yeah. Yes, sir. What do you think is the, is the possibility of commercial human space flight taking off? You know, the well, I hope it's tourism. very high. <laughs> uh, I see no reason why, if you include uh, the word commercial, is unfortunate in this. Why a, a public private partnership? with more responsibility being given to the private sector can't succeed uh, with effective NASA oversight, but not, you know, take step one this way and step two that way, uh, and, and overseers overseeing the overseers, uh, which is the NASA approach to safety in human spaceflight and in system development. Uh, I, uh, so, and it's not just SpaceX and orbital sciences. It, 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 in, in carrying crew to orbit, it could well be United Launch Alliance, could be Delta IV or Atlas V. Uh, so I, I think some set of capabilities developed through a revised public-private partnership can replace the shuttle on the crew carrying mission. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a catastrophe that it's taken us this long to get that replacement. Uh, but but uh, uh, you know, going back to a government-only system, I don't think it's the answer either. Yes, sir. Back on, on the, uh, the actual Apollo decision, um, it almost seems like the president, President Kennedy, made that decision on his own, um, and yet I can't imagine that Congress was not pretty well involved up front. And uh, well, they were consulted. Were they, con well, okay, were they consulted and did Congress <coughs> agree and understand how much it would cost? Um, that's a good question. You have to roll back the, the years, 50 years, where there was party discipline in Congress, and so the leaders of the majority party and even the leaders of the minority party could say, if you do this, we'll support it, and we'll support it for a number of years. And one of the things that Lyndon Johnson did in his consultations preparing the recommendations to Kennedy uh, was bring in the people he trusted from the Senate and the House leadership, particularly Sam Rayburn, uh, House, uh, Speaker of the House, who was from Texas, uh, and said, the President's thinking about this, can we count on your support? And the answer was yes. The, there was a lot of congressional rhetoric from people without much influence saying we've got to do something, we've got to catch up. So Kennedy could reasonably expect congressional approval of the proposal before he made it. But uh, Congress didn't have much influence on the proposal, uh, just a, a willingness to accept it. Was the Senate led by the Democrats at that point? Yes. Yeah, Senate Richard House. Russell of Georgia uh, was was not probably not the majority leader, but the most influential uh, Democrat in Stiles Bridges of New Hampshire. It was Russell and Bridges that LBJ uh, brought in to the consultation uh, and asked them whether they would support this, and they said yes. And Kennedy apparently did a lot of talking, including again remember Lyndon Johnson and Albert Thomas didn't get along. But Kennedy talked to Thomas and say, uh, here's something that's cooking. Will you support it in the appropriations uh, process? So again, yeah, Congress was consulted, different kind of Congress. There weren't existing vested interests, talk about lobbyists. There weren't much in the way of industrial pressures on Kennedy to do something <coughs> in particular, because there wasn't a very, the space program was very small at that point. One or two more. Yes, ma'am. Um, about the um, potential cooperation that can be a proposed motion yep. during the Apollo era. Um, and there seems to be some similarities between where we are with the Chinese now. So, what do you see there to be there any likelihood of taking those off the board in that era and to potentially be working with the Chinese? Uh, 
uh, well, it takes then and now it takes two to dance. Uh, uh, I mean, we've we have laid out some conditions for China uh, to be an acceptable partner, having to do with other elements of ch Chinese policy, which the Chinese have said are you know are none of our business, basically. Uh, I think. Over the next few years, there should be a gradual warming of space relations between the two countries. China has indicated its interest in getting involved in ISS. Whether that interest will lessen now that China has officially declared its intent to build its own space station uh, is not clear. Um, so, <coughs> China, well, there is this 14 space agency group called the International Space Exploration Coordination Group that's been working since 2006 at, at a staff level trying to figure out a global approach to exploration. And China, the Chinese Space Agency is an active participant in that group. So they're there, but at the political level, it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. <coughs> Well, there was an 
interest of some party <coughs> which has disappeared. Uh, and, and so there is no discipline. Uh, you know, we now have 535 entrepreneurs each pushing their own set of interests. And getting agreement among them is proving to be really hard. Uh, so, I, you know, how you fix that, I have no idea. Uh, there's another example of party outsourcing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe one unfortunate <coughs> way of doing it is an external challenge. Uh, but, um, <coughs> you know, if, if I had an answer to making Washington work, uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned uh, Congressman Ralph Hall, and you mentioned LBJ, which I just, yeah. So I didn't mention Hall. I will, but I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry, not Ralph Hall. Albert Thomas. Thomas, yeah. We have Golden T in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. What was his role? Uh, Tiger T was a very interesting <coughs> person. He pushed very hard on the Kennedy White House for his vision of the program which in the Kennedy period, he was afraid that we were not giving enough attention to the national security implications, uh, broad national security implications. Uh, this was before he became chair of the Manned Space Flight Subcommittee, I think. Uh, but he, he was a focused, active, almost feared 